You're listening to Halfway There, episode number 196, Kyle Strobel and Integrating Spirituality and Theology. Great conversation. Friends, welcome to Halfway There. This is the show where we have honest conversations with ordinary Christians about today's Christian experience. I'm your host, Eric Nevins. As always, I'm glad that you're here. Glad, glad that you downloaded and uh, are listening. I hope that this conversation is going to encourage you on the journey. That's what we try to do. Wherever you are in that journey, it's all okay. Be where you are. So here's here's our guest today. Our guest is the, he's got a great title, Associate Professor of Spiritual Theology at Talbot School of Theology and Biola University. So uh, our guest is Kyle Strobel. Kyle, welcome to Halfway There. Hey man, thanks so much for being here, Eric. It's good to be here. I'm excited to connect with you and hear uh, kind of a little bit about your story. And then also, um, you've got a new book out called Embracing Contemplation. So that's a topic we talk about here every once in a while. So I'm excited yeah. to talk about that. Do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and where God has you right now? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, you know, I, I've kind of bounced all over. I mean, my, my longer story, you know, is, is one of a kind of curious wandering for, for several <laughs> years, trying to kind of find the path that the Lord had for me. And um, where it led me over the years, uh, particularly um, to everyone's surprise, if I'm honest, it led me to the academy, which mm. no one anticipated, let alone me. And um, it eventually led me into spiritual formation. So this is going back several years now. I, I was at um, seminary. When um, Talbot and the seminary I'm at, when they started their Institute of Spiritual Formation. And, you know, it was funny because at the time, I, I, I'm i not sure I totally knew what that meant. Um, and then I kind of realized as I looked at my life, the Lord had put very important people in my life, one of which very early was John Ortberg, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I grew up in Willow Creek and Ortberg was like my go-to pastor. Like I'd go to his office and chat to him. And and so he kind of, you know, opened my eyes to some things. He had given me um, some Richard Foster's early work, some of the devotional stuff that he did. Wow. And then when I got to Talbot, I, I had a bunch of professors who were mentored by Dallas Willard. And this is the time when like Renovation of the Heart came out. I remember several of us um, reading that right when it came oh, out. Yeah. With And so so in many ways, I was kind of mentored by people who were mentored by Willard. And so I was heavily influenced there. And and yet I was looking for a life calling in a sense. I, I kind of knew I wanted to be a professor. I, that's what the Lord had for me. But I just didn't know in what. And then this program started. And so I came into this program. And right away, it was so clear to me. These are all the questions I've been asking. These are all the things that I can't, even if I wanted to, I couldn't not think about. And, and it was funny, though, because in being here, it, I, I had an epiphany when I was studying spiritual formation that there was a time, and actually through all of church history, Christians have assumed that theology and spirituality were one thing, not two things. Yes, and, you know, I, uh, I was surprised by that because when I was an undergrad Bible student, I read theology and thought, man, this is horrible. Like, this is, <laughs> this is dead, <laughs> uninteresting. You know, and evangelical theology, the 20th century, it was a bit of a debacle in its, in its own right. And I, I just was catechizing that stuff. And I thought it was death. I was like, this stuff's horrible. I'm glad I don't have to do it. And then I started studying spirituality and I realized wow, all of these folks were theologians. Yeah. I mean, even if you take like someone like John of the Cross, you know, at John of the Cross, there's an important moment of his life where he's looking one way going, well, I could teach Thomas Aquinas at Salem Blanca, or I could go in and become a monk, right? And, and it's like, for him, it, was, it wasn't one or the other in terms of theology or spirituality. It was, yeah. where do I do these things together? And, and so I left. I actually didn't finish my spiritual formation degree as much as I wanted to. Um, my wife and I really felt the Lord calling us to um, to pick up and move to Aberdeen, Scotland, where I did my PhD in theology. And, and you know, it, it, one of the most important kind of things that happened on my journey happened right around that time. Mm. My, um, my best friend and I, who was also in our spiritual formation department, um, we started a ministry called Metamorpha Ministries. And the, the idea, the initial idea was... But well, what if we had like a, a, a website someone could go to and actually find good material on spiritual formation? 
Because as you know, you do a search for spiritual information, some weird stuff comes up. Right. You'll oh. get all kinds of spirituality <laughs> and things. It's And it can be disturbing, right? Totally. Well, and how many like attacks that are totally misguided and uninformed. Uh, also that, yes. And so we we actually sat down with Dallas, Richard Foster. Um, I mean, everyone like well, there was a conference back then. This is back in probably 2005. There was a conference in, in Long Beach of spirit formation. And every single person that writes in the area was there. And so we just interviewed them all. And we thought we can actually have this database. Well, one thing that happened I didn't anticipate, which was we got viciously attacked wow. for doing this. All those crazy websites <laughs> of people who, you know, hear the word spiritual formation and assume the absolute worst. Um, they they really came after us hard. And and that began this interesting journey for me of a realization that I, you know, for myself this was true, but almost everyone else I knew as well, that when someone gets interested in spiritual formation. One of, the, one of the kind of negative things that can happen is that they can forget or cease to care about the weaker brother and sister. And instead of really doing the work to meet them where they're at, oftentimes I was just watching people write them off as, well, they don't get it and just moving on. And, and as these people attacked mm. me, you know, I, I of course wanted to just viciously, kind of, you know, annihilate their views and to kind of demolish them. And I felt the Lord kind of calling me to say, no, it is my job to meet them where they're at. Yeah. And in that moment, um, the Lord, in one of his really gracious moves of providence in my life, led me to Jonathan Edwards. And so I did my PhD on Jonathan Edwards. And um, as my supervisor told me when he suggested it, he's like, Kyle, he's like, this was the last generation where spirituality and theology were one thing. And so over the years, I, I've done a lot of work in Puritan and Wesleyan and early evangelical spirituality. And, and what I found is in many ways astonishing that actually everything I was always looking for, we, our mm. own tradition has already talked about and no one's read it. Right. <laughs> and so that is led me to where I am now. So I teach in our, our Institute of Spiritual Formation here, a whole variety of things. Um, and it's... Um, it's students coming in doing either an MDiv as you did or an MA or in wanting to be a spiritual director or something. I do a lot of the theology and the history kind of stuff for our department. Yeah, very cool. All really important kind of kind of things that round out what you what you get in the in seminary, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, very good. Okay, so I want to hear more about your story, about some of the experiences. I'd love to hear yeah. some stories about experiences that you've had, how God's kind of worked with you, um, and what that's like. So you kind of that was a great. Uh, overview. So growing up at Willow Creek, I mean, that's so you and I were probably in Chicago around the same time then I was there like 97 to 04, probably. Okay. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. uh, what was that like growing up, growing up at Willow Creek? Cause that's, you know, we have a kind of, you know, everybody's heard of it, but not everybody's sure. been kind of. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think Willow's a kind of place where it's so big that you mm. can have any n number of experiences there, right? It's a lot of cultures. Totally. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, it was unique because I kind of had access to Ortberg. Yeah. And I had really close friends there. And so for me, you know, it was all that I knew. I grew up there. So it's the only church I'd ever known. Um, I loved John and to this day, loved John. And he he was profound and in terms of his influence on me personally. Um, and Ortberg, you know, is one of those guys that I would be walking through the halls with a friend of mine. And I'd introduce him to John and, and, you know, a month later he'd see us again and still remember that person's name. Like he was wow. incredible pastorally. And just in terms of kind of being able to hold and a place that large, that many kind of people that he's running into. I mean, he knew your name and he, he recognized you and he'd, he'd want to kind of be with you pastorally. And, and then, you know, from there, I, it was really, I had kind of this profound, leaving Willow, actually, um, I left with a lot of relational brokenness, mm. um, particularly from the youth ministry. So the youth ministry was going through a lot of tumultuous kind of stuff when I was there. I left and went to college locally and started studying scripture and kind of realized like, wow, I was never taught this in, in my youth ministry. Like I... I didn't know how to read my Bible. And suddenly I get to Bible college and this stuff is profound for me. And I kind of realized at that moment how much I had not been given. Mm. 
and how so much of my life had become vice laden because I was simply trying to get my act together. And, and in many ways, and this is true of any place I imagine um, that has youth ministries where, because I had a lot of friends, wasn't, you know, didn't have a hard time standing in front of people talking. Like I was thrust into positions of ministry and leadership well beyond my maturity and character. And, and that did a lot of damage to me. So I, I was actually quite angry for several years. It took me quite a long time to kind of work through my own stuff in terms of, of my background and, but then I went to college and in studying, I, I kind of mentioned, I, I, no one anticipated I'd have an academic inclination. I was a terrible student in high school, <laughs> just didn't care, you know? And suddenly I started studying scripture and I was like, this is everything I've been looking for. And I never oh, knew interesting. it. And so that was a profound season, but it was of course built now on this previous brokenness. And so I was now again, thrust into leadership, vice laden beyond my maturity, but I was growing in knowledge. Yeah. And I, I kind of hoped, I thought at the time that maybe if I just learn enough, yeah, then somehow just poof, you know, I would be holy and, <laughs> and transformed. And, and so I had these weird experiences of being transformed intellectually in all sorts of profound ways, while at the same time, having these deep vices, having deep struggles. And, and that came to a moment. There was a, there was a kind of a point in my undergrad years. I was an RA. So I was at a Christian college, you know, RAs are seen as kind of spiritual leaders. And so I was there and I was in my room one evening and I was reading a book. I can't even remember the book, but I was reading a book that said something about prayer. And it, I had this epiphany in that moment that I, I don't believe in prayer. Wow. Well, and, and why? Well, so what did you think prayer reason, was? Yeah, well, the, the 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 kind of thing that came to my mind was, well, if I if prayer is being able to converse with the God who created the universe, and I never do it, then I don't believe in it. Like if 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 I actually believe God is present to me, if I have access to God, and I just don't, then I don't believe something. I you know, there's something going on, and that. I remember the first, this is the first thing that this has happened to me, like where where the first time in my life, I was confronted with something so profound in terms of my own failure that I immediately got up, walked down the hall, went to my other RA and said, we need to talk. I've just had this realization, like something has deeply gone wrong in my spiritual life. And he's like, well, what? I said, well, look, I don't pray. I, I clearly don't believe in prayer. And he said, yeah, I don't pray either. And I was like, oh, so, <laughs> You're not going to help me. So the two of us walked down to another guy's office and the guy's, the guy's now a pastor. We, we confess our sins to him. And he says, yeah, I don't pray. Either. Oh, wow. <laughs> and suddenly there's like 12 of us. Yeah. And I'm like, this is an epidemic. And, you know, that moment, there was a couple things that profoundly hit me. The first of which was, it actually took my honestly wrestling with myself to open up other people's lives. Like that actually is still profound wow. for me that, that it that actually I was most relatable in my failures than certainly than much more than in my successes. <clears throat> and so that was important. But then the realization that, wow, there's a real neglect going on in a Christian campus, you know, there's, you kind of just suppose everyone's kind of got their act together. <laughs> yeah. And and, it and everybody clear to me. Everybody pretends like they've got their act together. And everyone pretends. And that's the thing is what we were all doing. We were all kind of projecting because we thought, well, they clearly get it. And I, I, I you know, I must. So I, maybe I'll just <laughs> try hard. And, um, and of course, we were all doing the things that made us feel better, probably reading our Bibles, you know, one chapter a day or whatever it was. Right things that we can kind of check off, but, but actually wrestling with God in the messy reality of prayer. That was something that, I mean, it certainly didn't do what we wanted, which is make us feel better about our life with God. If anything else, it, it made us feel worse. Yeah. And so that, that was a, a incredibly profound moment for me. And then from there I went to seminary and, you know, a lot of this was more kind of, of the same stuff of wrestling with, of like, you know, I had the realization that, wow, I, I need to give myself to prayer. But of course, I, I didn't have anyone to really help me walk through that. Yeah. 
and so it was just more trying hard to pray well. Right. <laughs> so whatever that means. You know. I, so this gets at something that I I'd like to talk about because yeah. You know, I grew up very evangelical as well. I went to Trinity and I went to, I went to, and finished up here in Denver. But, um, like as evangelicals, we have these kind of two spiritual disciplines, right? Read your Bible and pray. And nobody ever teaches yeah. you how to do either, really. Yeah. Yeah. So to hear you say, oh, I want to start studying scripture and it just opened up, right? Cause mm-hmm. there, that's such a foundational, important piece of our faith. And when you see the whole picture finally, cause you, you're, we're used to getting, little bits every Sunday or, sure. you know, little bits in whatever it is we're doing. And then when you finally see the whole picture and you see what God is up to, it actually is good news, right? It's not yeah. just getting out of, out of uh, hell free. It's like, oh no, that's a God's doing something in history and Jesus affect you know, all that. So um, I can see that. But then also the prayer thing, that's really interesting because it took, uh, personally, I had the same or a similar experience where it was like, I can't. I don't know what to do. I'm tired of asking for stuff and then being disappointed that it doesn't. Totally. What What is this about? Maybe there's more here. And so that sounds like it fed some of your desire for God. It, it both fed it, but then awoken something that was uh, more confusing than not in a sense. Yeah, yeah. I kind of now had this drive of, of okay, I, I need to give myself to this. But it was still something I'm doing. I'm giving myself to. I'm wrestling. And so – I, you know, I took that into seminary and of course, seminary as seminaries do, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm just kind of, and actually I was a philosophy student. So I, I was studying philosophy like crazy now. And, and yet I'm running into Willard at this point mm. and the way he's talking, I'm like, I'm not experiencing that. And, and that really led to, you know, I had a, after I finished my philosophy degree, I moved back home. So I actually lived in Arlington Heights. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I moved back home. Um, I didn't do it because I thought that's what the Lord had for me. I did it because back home is where things usually worked for me. And I kind of thought, great, we'll go back here. Things will start working again. And it was a whole year of everything not working. Oh, <laughs> it wow. Just a, it was, it was my desert. And I had an epitome of a, a kind of classic dark night sort of experience. And well, I actually d- remember. Take us through that anyway. because, because that's yeah, like, yeah. we. I love to ask that question for the reason of, I, I want people to know that that's normal. Like that happens. Totally, so yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, it's coming, it was coming of a kind of a season of, of what I think of as, as um, what the Puritans would actually call a season of desertion mm. from God. That's, that's the term they use for the dark night of the soul. They go back and forth, but desertion was one of them. And it was this desert like kind of reality that eventually led me to the point. I remember one evening I was in my apartment alone. I was praying and it, I w- I'd really been struck with the notion of an experience of abandonment. Mm. And I remember praying, Lord, you know, maybe you have abandoned me. And it was the first time in my life where I kind of was open to, Lord, that's what this feels like. I'm just going to name that. Like, Lord, I just, I, I feel like you've abandoned me. And then I prayed and maybe that's okay. Wow. Oh, Yeah. And that was the moment where things really began to shift. And, and, you know, it's funny because I had an undergrad professor, you know, one of those random asides, you know, so who knows what rabbit trail that he got on, but he mentioned the dark night of the soul and my mind popped back to it. I had this memory of like, wait a second, I, we talked about this and it was so helpful because it gave me categories to navigate like I've got to be able to speak truly about what I'm actually experiencing. Right. But then recognize my experience doesn't necessarily have access to reality. And so, you know, one of the verses that's become a really important verse for me um, over the years is um, 1 John 3, 19 and 20, where we, we have this interesting scene where we are, quote unquote, before him. So we're in the presence of God and our heart condemns us. And I think it's interesting that Apostle John assumes that for Christians, we will experience condemnation in God's presence. Like, I think that's an important reality in and of itself. Yeah. And then he turns you not to your own inner resources, but to God's goodness. And he says, God is greater than your heart and he knows everything. Wow. And and so this reality of if I can name the, the, the kind of negative experiences of my life and trust that God is good. And so that's what I did. And I said, I remember thinking to myself, God, even if you have abandoned me, it's still the best thing to to seek you and to follow you. Like it, it's not like even if that were true, it wouldn't somehow mean, well, I can just eat, drink for tomorrow. We die. That doesn't even make sense. And that moment was so profound because it helped me realize, I think 
that it, it, I, mo- looking at this much later, I kind of think of Bernard's categories of love where St. Bernard, you know, is going to talk about, you know, St. Bernard assumes we kind of come to God narcissistically, you know, and then yeah. he, he thinks, well, God's going to have to lead us on a journey to love him for his own sake and eventually to love ourselves for, for our, for his sake. And it was that moment of, I think God helping me realize he is lovable for his own sake. Yeah. And up until yes. now, I've really more loved him because I thought it would be good for me. And that was a gift, you know, that that realization that not only is God lovable for his own sake, but somewhere very deep in me, mm-hmm. there's a a willing yet that that's true. Um, and an embrace as much as my life didn't ent- look like that, as much as I didn't want it to be true, there was this realization, no, that is still true though. And me saying kind of yes to that, me consenting to that, right. intending to still follow. Um, and it was from there that I, I actually went back. I moved back to California and eventually came to study um, in, in the department I'm in. And that was just so profound for me. I mean, um, my mentor, actually, who I co-edited this book with, John Coe, um, he and I are actually just finishing a manuscript on prayer. So we're writing a kind of an introduction to prayer. But one of the things John said to me when I was a student, he said to our class, that I remember this is early on too. So this is right when I started studying spiritual formation. He says to our class, it, you know, prayer is not a place to be good. It's a place to be honest. Mm, wow. And that little kind of note that just totally transformed my prayer life and my realization that, wow, I've always, and this is that evangelicalism you're talking about. There's something that when, even though no one would have said it, what I, what I internalized was that prayer is a performative act. And God's kind of up there judging it as if like, ah, oh, you use the wrong word there, or, uh, you know, you're not talking to the wrong person or, you know, like right. God's just kind of, ju- and so I'm trying to do it right, say the right thing, sit the right way. And, and the realization that it matters more if I'm honest here than if I'm good at this yes. was just yeah. life changing. Oh, I love that. So, right. And I think you get that from scripture. So do, like that. But you have to be looking for it, right? You can look. That's right. So I, I use Habakkuk all the time as a as an example because I wrote a little thing. Uh, it's on the website called "What to Do When You're Mad at God," using Habakkuk as a as an example. Yeah, yeah. But Habakkuk goes to God and he and he makes his complaints, right? And then God responds. And you can read that and listen and look for the prophecy, and then go see that God's going to take out sure. justice, what his justice on the Babylonians and Israel and everybody. Mm. But if you read it for relationship, you get a whole different thing, right? Habakkuk mm. is honest with God. Yeah. And he says, Hey, I don't like what's happening. What's going on? And then God responds graciously. He's like, Hey, don't worry. I'm going to take care of him. Then Habakkuk yeah. gets even more indignant and goes, Hey, wait, I don't, <laughs> I don't like them either. What are you going to do about them? And God says, don't worry. I'm going to take care of them too. And then Habakkuk worships. And that's where we get the righteous will live by faith. Mm, right. Yeah. yeah. Cause all that honesty, I think with God back and forth mm. yields righteousness by surrendering to that. Well, I love that. I think that is really is really beautiful. So that's so that that surrender to prayer or to to God in prayer um, sounds like it was really profound. Yeah, that was that was life changing in in more ways than one. I mean that mm. that really helped me. I think get a sense of and you know it was it was it was when I realized that that I could actually finally start praying the Psalms as well. Oh yeah, because right. until that point, I just couldn't, right? Because I'm like, God doesn't want to hear this, <laughs> which is so weird, right? Why would we think that? That's right. It's like God's word, but I'm, I'm thinking he he doesn't want it, you know. Um, but that's we all have that experience. But if if again, if prayer's performative, the psalter makes no sense, right? And and so that that became an incredibly profound kind of transformation for me. And then, to be honest, my, it was my study of Edwards and the Puritans in our own kind mm. of background. And this is something Willard used to tell people. Well, you know, Dallas used to say, when if someone asked him, you know, who should I read? He'd say, go look in your own tradition, mm. go back to the person that started it, and you'll find a spiritual master and understand them. Wow. And Dallas, you know, what's interesting about Dallas that very few people know, and as far as I can tell, none of his disciples have really picked up from him, is that he was a thoroughgoing Wesleyan. Oh, interesting. Dallas knew Wesley inside and out. Next to his couch, he had quote, he had a quote, this whole quote framed from Wesley. He can quote Wesley off the top of his head. Wesley framed his whole understanding. And what's interesting about Wesley's era, early evangelicalism, yeah. whether you were reformed or, or Wesleyan, you actually on the ground had the same view. 
they had no difference really. Um, whether you're Edwards, who's obviously reformed, or what, and what is what does Wesley do with Edwards? He republishes him. Now he he tweaks some of the theology that he doesn't like. Yeah, like predestination stuff. <laughs> he right, gets rid of that. But when it comes to like the on the ground reality, they have the exact same view, and they really help me understand more than anyone alive the nature of spiritual practices. Yeah. Um, I, you know, one of the first things I did when I finished my doctorate on Edwards was write a little book. Um, basically, I wanted to say, if Jonathan Edwards were alive today, what would he say about spirit formation? And so I wrote a little book called Form for the Glory of God that just kind of looks through what, like, if I could, like, transport myself 300 years ago, what would we have assumed is obvious about the spiritual life? And I, I kind of wanted to just feel the pressure of that personally. And I wanted us all to feel the pressure of that personally. And and some of it's what you'd expect, but most of it wasn't, you know, the, their view of Sabbath, their view of praying in soliloquy, which is like the Psalter, you know, the psalmist who prays, oh, my soul, it is within me. And now there's this kind of internal dynamic in prayer. Yeah. Their view of, as Paul would say, be watchful in prayer in Colossians 4, 2. Like what is watchfulness? They, they make a really big deal about having a watchful soul, their view of conferencing, which is having this kind of inner dynamic with others where you're kind of breaking open your heart and, and particularly in relation to the word, like how did the preach word break you open and what came out? And, and I was astonished by that. And they had this beautiful vision and, and in particular their view of spiritual practices, not as spiritual disciplines, but as means of grace. Yeah. That is not that that spiritual disciplines can't be a means of grace. I worry about the term discipline because I think sometimes we, we, we hear that term and that term gets caught up in a kind of modern framework. That's not theological. It's just me forming myself, right. trying hard right. to kind of undo vice or something. But if grace is God's self-giving, then the means of grace are means of, of receiving God and embracing him. And that just totally altered for me what these things are. And how we understand the spiritual life, and so that that became an incredibly profound kind of part of my my self understanding, my my journey with the Lord, my even my understanding of myself as an evangelical. Which that term has been so odd over the last several years. Yeah. I haven't even known what to do with it a lot of times. But then to kind of know, know a little bit more about my own tradition, realizing, wow, we have a rich spiritual tradition, and it has some funny ticks to it. You know, like one of the <laughs> things that we used to do a lot of is we used to just take Catholic books reproduce them and put our name on them. <laughs> and so it's not unusual to find whole books by like, like imitation of Christ with the sacrament last chapter knocked off and, you know, John Smith written as the author. Really? Oh, sure. Uh, and, you know, Richard Baxter, who's, you know, a yeah. famous, you know, you know, he became a Christian through a Jesuit text that had been re um, repurposed under a Puritan name. Right. And we used to do this all the time. And it's, it's there was a recognition that there's a universal tradition out there that we can embrace. We need to read it appropriately because we're Protestants. We have Protestant ideas, you know. Like we, there's a certain theology here we need to be, be careful about. But there was also a recognition that no, no, it, it's, it's much broader than just our niche kind of thing. We need to read very broadly, and they all did read very broadly. Yeah, which is what comes out in embracing contemplation, right? You talk about Richard Baxter in the introduction. That's right. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, really interesting. Okay. I want to ask you a couple of questions about, yeah. um, which I guess it's my show. I get to do that. The, um, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the, uh, so about Jonathan Edwards and, and Wesley, right? Cause yeah, yeah. I, this, you intrigued me there a little bit. So one of the things when I was uh, studying church history and we read a little bit of Jonathan Edwards, he had a, a really interesting view, right? Of, um, he wrote that mm-hmm. book. Um, I forget the title of it. I'm looking at my shelves cause it, it's probably up there somewhere, <laughs> but, um, uh, about, uh, the revivals, right. The first great awakening and how people were having all these kind of weird manifestations and things. And people yeah. asked him like, what are you or on revival? It's called, what are you, what are you, what do you think about that? And his view doesn't seem Puritan to me, right? He was like, Hey, look, mm-hmm. if it's the Holy spirit, I'm not going to stop it. You know? Yeah. Well, Edwards was interesting because he's, he's a total modern. So in one sense, he has these theological views, about um, he's a cessationist, so like, he's going to presuppose no no healings happen huh. anymore. No one's going to speak in tongues, right? And everyone was in his day. There was no one that didn't believe that, in, in at least in the um, the part of the world he was in. But then he's preaching, and someone falls on the ground and starts writhing about. Edwards goes, 
huh, that might be the spirit. <laughs> right. Let's ask them. <laughs> right. And he'd interview him. Like, how do you, what are you feeling right now? And, how do we, you know? and so Edwards, you know, one of his most famous books is The Religious Affections. And that book, which is the last thing he wrote after all of this. So he, you know, he got really attacked by rationalists about the revivals. And Edwards wrote the religious affections as a way to try to say, no, 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 there's a way. Yes. Have people done crazy things? Yes. Have people made excesses? Sure. Does that mean it's wrong? No. And actually, one of my favorite arguments from the religious affections is he says, if if God is at work, what should you expect? (laughs) You should expect Satan to sow seeds of discord that mimic it to try to devalue it and undermine it. That is a fascinating argument yeah. that wherever God's at work, you should expect to find acts of Satan there that mimic it, that look like it, but there actually are attempts to kind of devalue the whole thing. And so, you know, in an era where everyone mm. had to go to church or you were fined, <laughs> right. it's, it, and that's true, right? Everyone, there's not, there's no unchurched people at this point. <laughs> Suddenly tens of thousands are becoming Christians. They're going to revivals. I mean, this is a very interesting and unique kind of scenario. Well, Edwards writes the religious affections. The first section is theory. So it's it's like one chapter on theory. And it's like, well, what is an affection? And so for Edwards, he didn't believe you can just have what he called speculative knowledge, which is just knowledge about God, we might say. You have to know God as God knows himself, which is affectionately. You have to know him personally, we might say. Then he gives 12 what he what we call now negative signs, which they're not negatives are kind of the wrong word because they're not necessarily bad or negative. They just don't tell you anything. So let's take a modern example. You hear people say things like, well, God opened a door. And Edward say, that tells you nothing. Doors open. A door might slam in your face that you still might need to walk through it. Like it doesn't give you discernment or, well, a verse came to mind. Satan uses verses too. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. And so he kind of clears the ground of all these ways we try to use discernment that actually aren't that discerning. And then he gives 12 positive signs of discernment. And so the whole book is a book of how do you discern the work of the spirit from false works? And Edwards has seen this. You know, he he was in his own mind a bit naive year early in his life where he assumed it just because someone had some experience that, well, that must mean they're a Christian yeah. and a year later they're not, and they've abandoned it all. And he, he is, wow, what, what, what happened there? And, and so, you know, in many ways, that's a, it's a good example in terms of the modern spiritual discussion, like Edwards, we're not doing anything different than what Edwards did. Um, now Edwards did it as a theologian and as a pastor. So that, that context is important. And I think, unfortunately, because most of us learn theology, divorce from spirituality, we have a tendency to have an a theological spirituality, which can lead into some problems. Now, there's also the, it goes the other way. Our theology dies when spirituality is divorced from it. Right. Um, but in the Edwards and Wesley and in the Puritans, what you find are people who saw these things wedded together. And it's astonishing. I mean, some of the most brilliant and psychologically rich things I've ever read came out of the Puritan tradition. And it's and yet, by and large, it's untouched, particularly in terms of the modern spiritual formation movement. It, it, of all the people that we read, we tend not to read a lot of that kind of material, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I read a lot of that when I had my Calvinist face, my reform sure. face. So. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to have one of those in seminary. But that's right. Anyway, that's uh, really interesting. But so Edwards fascinates me for that same reason, though, because he's very like. He he is reformed, but he's still very open and spiritual. And there's so, there's something there's something it seems I don't know more interesting. Even though he's known for the you know sinners in the hands of anger God kind of sure. thing. There's a whole thing um, that's a different discussion. So then the other thing about Wesley that I think is really interesting, and I need to do some reading on Wesley probably, but I love his quadrilateral that idea right of how sure. we, how we know. And so for friends, if you don't know that, it's these the four things. So what is it? It's theology. Or scripture. Well, it's sources of knowledge. So, so Bible. Right. Um, it's um, tradition. It's natural kind of knowledge and then experience. Right. And adding experience there. So that's one thing that this this podcast has really done for me, right? So we, you heard me in the beginning, honest conversations with ordinary Christians about today's Christian experience, because yeah. I want to know what people are actually experiencing about or with God these days. Um, and so... I didn't think that was valued, certainly not in my tradition or where I came from, you know? Um, yeah. I think it matters. But it's certainly, 
Yeah, sorry. It's certainly true that, you know, with not only Wesley, but I would say the entire Puritan tradition presupposes mm. that as well. Yeah. Like they didn't necessarily articulate it, but like for Edwards, that's really obvious that, that this is one of his instincts. Even at times, like he, he has this great quote when someone he kind of, he's questioning like, well, he talks about love all the time. For Edwards, love was everything, um, which is ironic considering we only yeah. know him for Sinners in the Hand. But you know what's interesting? when in, in light of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, you have to keep in mind Edwards did not believe you could come to God out of fear. Oh, interesting. You can only come to God if you see him as beautiful. So Sinners, the sermon Sinners in the Hands of an Angry was supposed to wake up what he called sermon-proof people. Uh, it, it wasn't supposed to – it was supposed to kind of break them out of their slumber – and then he was going to cast a vision of God's beauty to them. Right, right. We don't get to that second part. We just kind of like right. the first. But he gets to love because love, again, for Edwards, everything is love. And it's um, – he kind of wonders like, well, how do you define love? And he kind of says, well, it's better felt than defined. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's interesting. Like he yeah. says, well, you kind of know. But – if I try to define it, it'll kind of ruin it. <laughs> right. Interesting. Yeah. So that's, so that's, which is not as cerebral as you would expect, right? As, as the way, certainly yeah. my impression of, of both Edward and the Puritans are. Yeah. 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 No, it's in the, the Puritans is, is a little hard because there's actually two different strands of Puritanism okay. and one is much more affective. One is much more the cerebral rationalist. And that, those are the ones that kind of won. So that's who we think of. Ah. Whereas the other line was a really, really rich line. It reminds me of there's a phenomenal book written by Belden Lane. If you know anything, Belden Lane wrote a great book on Desert Fathers, Desert Manas- like Desert Spirituality years ago. But he came out with a book called Ravished by Beauty, and it's on reform spirituality. And I thought, like, knowing reform spirituality, like, that's a perfect title. Like, yeah. If you're going to sum up reform spirit, look, ravished by beauty is it. But of course, that sounds crazy to most people because you don't think of reform theology and, and beauty right. or ravishment. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I think of them much more theological or cerebral mm-hmm. uh, for sure. Interesting. But okay. even like Edwards is interested in the affect, right? It was, right, it was right. Affections, right. And for him, be- the, the only way you come to God is out of seeing him as beautiful. Um and, and being ravished by him. And Edwards is, you know, Edwards had these ecstatic religious experiences. He did. And his wife had a famous experience um, where for a week she was unable to function fully because she had this profound um, ecstatic experience of the risen Lord. Wow. Which I think is just amazing. And also partly yeah. we, we don't, I, I don't know, we don't talk about that. Oftentimes in, in evangelical spirituality, those kinds of things are thought to be a little bit, not just weird, but a little bit <laughs> emotional. And I don't want to touch it because it's kind of, kind of strange. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so how, like, how is, you know, you said love was, a, uh, Jonathan, that was, was all about love. How's that, how's that play out for you? Like, have you had any experiences where that kind of, so I would say that's sort of the, the last stage of the journey, right? That kind of, mm-hmm. you know, we're all kind of striving to go there. What, how does that work out in your life? Yeah. Well, I mean, it gets a little bit into um, a little bit closer into the nature of the book um, on, you know, for John and I, the idea of embracing contemplation is, can be summarized by embracing love, but that gets dangerous too. I mean, here, and here's yeah. the, here's where it gets hard, you know, both theoretically and interpersonally, you know, when, when we say that God is love, there's two ways to take that. One way is to say, oh, I know what love is. God's like this. And that's what I think culturally has happened. A lot of kind of um, spirituality means new age does that. As a theologian, when I hear God is love, the first thing I have to think is I don't know what love is then until I look to God. And so for me, suddenly, and this is true certainly for Edwards, if, if I say God is love, now I have to set my mind on Christ and God's self-giving. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what that's meant for me is, is what the, the Catholic tradition would talk about is purgative contemplation. Um, what the, the Puritans, again, would talk about it in terms of darkness, desertion, at times deadness, where w- what God's love does is it confronts us with all sorts of things we want rather than love. And so there's this this immediate and initial kind of purgative reality. The problem we have, and the problem I've always I've struggled with my whole, my whole Christian life has been, 
I presuppose that God's presence will equal excitement, will equal zeal, will equal, you know, what I've been looking for. Right. And yet it doesn't, it, it, it equals this. Now I see my, my sin. Now I see my brokenness. Now I see desires. I don't want to see. Now I see, you know, suddenly that to set my mind on love is it, it looks more like first John three nineteen. It feels more like condemnation. And, and then to trust that God is who he is and that my condemnation, my experience of condemnation can't be projected upon him. But that's what we do, right? We naturally have this sense of, I feel condemned. God's condemning me. It's like, no, no, no. God's greater and he knows everything and he is love. And so it's, it's kind of being, it's just kind of trusting that the journey to God is, is a journey of love. And it's a journey where quite a lot of the time we wouldn't name what we experience as love. <laughs> yeah. And having to wrestle with that and the existential reality of, 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 of internalizing that. And again, you know, it was Edwards, you know, one of the th funny things he said that struck me is, you know, at the end of his life or towards the end of his life, he's looking and by this point, he was seen as not only an intellectual giant and a lot of people thought the greatest thinker of his age, but he was seen as a spiritual giant. And he says, you know, when I look back at my life and I look at myself and I had just become a Christian, I think I was a lot better Christian back then. <laughs> And he goes, now I just, I just see so much of my sin. I just see so many ways that I don't embrace God. And I remember reading that going, that's exactly right. That is exactly yeah. right. Like in your youthful zeal, you kind of think, yeah, I'm almost there. I just got one or two sins to knock off and then me and God, and we're going to dominate right. the world. And he leads him into, and of course, back then, no one thought he was a saint. No one thought he was the spiritual kind of, no one thought he had spiritual depth it actually takes him to see his weakness, right? Yeah. That he's then understood as powerful. And, you know, so for me, a lot of the journey has been saying, okay, Lord, this is what your word tells me is true. This is what I, I can know is true through the tradition. The tradition that proclaims this is true. I don't want this to be true, <laughs> <laughs> but your will not might be done. And, and me just kind of journey on trusting that, no, this is, this is the way of love. This is what it entails. And it's, um, I find encouragement that the people we consider spiritual masters all say this is the way. Yes, they do. Um, whether that's John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, Jonathan Edwards, Bunyan. Bunyan was profound on this and stuff. You know, it's like oh, yeah. this is the way, and and we need to continue to go on this way. And um, Bunyan actually is a funny one because Bunyan, one of my favorite scenes of the Pilgrim's Progress is when Christian journeys up the Delectable Mountain, and he meets four shepherds of discernment. And you have knowledge and experience. Oh, interesting. I need to read that. Watchfulness. Yeah. <laughs> and sincerity. And so you have two kind of more static disciplines. You have knowledge and watchfulness, which are these things they give us. But then the other side of them is you have, again, experience, fundamental role. And then sincerity is what we think of as authenticity. And uh. so what Christian has to learn is he has to know and he has to have these experiences of, with God but he's got to do so as one who's who's utterly sincere about his failure, which it comes out throughout the book is his failure. And um, now there's some weird stuff, but I wouldn't adopt totally all of his progress. <laughs> but it, you know, it's funny about that is what is he? What is the gift that the shepherds give them? They give him a looking glass so he could set his minds on the things above. Mm. And that's like that. That always struck me so interesting is that it took him seeing the truth so that he can set his mind on the heavenly city, as it says in the book. But then he, his hands start shaking because he sees all the future temptations he must journey through. And he, so you get a little bit of a glimpse of Peter on the wet water. Yeah. And he's looking at the waves and instead of looking at Jesus, he looks at the waves and he kind of falters. Um, and the realization of, as first John three says is no, in the midst of your struggles, you look to Christ, he's greater and he knows all. Yeah. And yet how often I still, look at myself and think you should be better than this. How are you still struggling with this? Or why are you so bad at this? Why is your mind still wandering? And my turn to maybe if I'm just kind of, kind of beat myself with my, my desire and my ideal Christian idea that maybe that'll get me going instead of saying, no, no, no. Like it's, at, it's precisely here that I need Jesus. Yeah. Um, and that has been profound. And my, my, that's been my journey, my a continual journey of, of, of 
trusting that, no, this is the way, and it's the way of faith. I, I want sight now. He doesn't have sight for me. <laughs> he has faith for me. Right. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, yes, our weaknesses draw us into Christ, right? That's, mm, that's, right, that's yeah. the way that works. Okay, so the book is called, let's, let's move to that, because it's called Embracing Contemplation, Reclaiming a Christian Spiritual Practice. I know we've kind of been talking about some of those ideas, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But so what are you wanting to do? What are, you, what are you hoping the book does? Yeah, well, one of the reasons we did this, you know, as, as you probably well know, you know, the, the way we get attacked and I'm in an institution. So at Biola where now, because I'm here, because we do this stuff here, the institution can get attacked. And it's like, you know, you have people talking about contemplation. This is some key, an Eastern new agey sort of thing. Right. And so the first thing we wanted to do is say, look, first, you know, this is the thing of spiritual formation is most attacked for, but quite honest, like you could believe in spiritual formation and not believe in contemplate. Like that's right. not like that's all we're talking about. So like one, we wanted to say that, but two, no one talks about this. Like we've kind of realized like in the circles, in the evangelical circles we run in, who's writing on contemplation today? Who's even talking about it? And, and because we're all kind of, we all kind of know each other, when we talk to each other about it, it's clear that we have some different ideas, we have some different sources. We, and I think one of, the, one of the things that most needs to be talked about is how does the act of contemplation relate to what we call contemplative prayer? Yeah. Because in my own studies, I've come to believe that that is a confusion of terms, actually. Oh, interesting. Um, no one in the tradition talks about contemplative prayer. Um, it's not a thing. There's wordless prayer and contemplation, which isn't a form of prayer. And at some point, I think someone just kind of either wanted to confuse things or didn't know what they were talking about and, mel and merge them. And what happened is contemplation and acts just disappeared. And now we think of contemplative prayer. And I think what's happened is basically wordless prayer is now called contemplative prayer. Ah, okay. And so, I mean, for an obvious example, if you take someone like Thomas Keating centering prayer, right. what Keating is doing is he's simply giving a method to the cloud of a knowing. But if you read the cloud of a knowing, at no point will you ever discover something called contemplative prayer. Like that's the cloud author has no knowledge of such a thing. Or even like, even as late as someone like Madame Guyon, she talks about silent prayer, but never contemplative prayer. And so, so part of me, us, we like one, we just want to say, let's admit that we have different views. And, and it, I was pleasantly surprised that we all have in general, the same sense of things. I was pretty surprised because again, that, that wasn't planned. It was just like, tell us what, what you're thinking about these things, use sources that you use and then relate it to this discussion of contemplative prayer. And that's really where we have the most difference, I suppose. Um, and so we wanted to kind of help jumpstart a new conversation about these things, but then also show that this is something that evangelicals have always talked about. The history of evangelical spirituality is a history of a discussion of contemplation. And nowhere was that more obvious to me than in a book by Richard Baxter that was called a purely biblical account by John MacArthur of all people. <laughs> And Baxter's taught saying, well, you know, there's action and contemplation and we're all called to contemplation. And he just lays out this whole contemplative spirituality. You know, this, you know, this is what people don't realize, I think, is that the Christian tradition is steeped in this. Um, and one of my, you know, uh, there are several, I, I love this book, but one chapter that I really, it just kind of made me smile was Ash Coxworth, who's a brilliant spiritual theologian, wrote a chapter on Calvin on contemplation. Nice. And one of the things I love about it is <laughs> Calvin would say, if you want, when you practice Sabbath, Saturday evening, go outside and gaze upon the stars and locate yourself in God's world. And Ash kind of wonders if spirit, if um, light pollution is a form of spiritual warfare then, because we are no longer wow. able to do that. I'm like, I love that. Like that, that's exactly the kinds of question we should be asking. And so we're trying to set up, you know, an evangelical conversation, a uh, broadly Protestant, we might say evangelical conversation of what is this practice? How does it relate to contempl contemplative prayer as we call it, or prayer in general? And then how do we think as evangelicals about these things? Yeah, I love that. Well, I think that's very, very needed. I get, um, you know, I've had people on the show talk about things like centering prayer and Kind of how to do it and things like that and different different practices, but it's always a little bit, you know, it can be unnerving for people, right? Because if, if they're yeah. not familiar with it, um, so I love just the exploration of what does this actually mean and what what is it like and mm -hmm. yeah, 
Yeah. And if, you know, for, so in my chapter, one of the things I try to do is I try to give an account of, of contemplation and, and prayer that's grounded theologically on the intercession of the son and the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so for me, if you're going to talk about wordless prayer, which is again, the more traditional notion uh, than, than contemplative prayer, wordless prayer at its most base is, is a simple movement of faith. In a sense, there's, there's a way we could talk about it where it's, a wordless prayer is actually one word. It's just simply amen. And it's where I don't trust in my words, but in the intercession of the Son and the Spirit. And it, I am kind of carried along on their work. Now, the hard thing for me is in wordless prayer, what I have to realize about myself is I want to wield my words at God. All right. Because my words are ways to try to get tethers kind of into God to tether into myself. And, and wordless prayer simply trusts that his praying is enough. And that, I think at its very base, that's what wordless prayer always was. It's not that word, wordlessness is somehow better than words, it, but it's a realization that I, I am carried along by another, not by my activity, but by his activity. And that funds my my very existence and my calling, and so it's it's simply trusting in that, and that so that'd be one way of seeing and understanding the nature of this. Now, there's going to be others yeah. that do it slightly differently than that. Yeah. Well, you said an important word there, which is trust, right? We we can trust mm -hmm. that His prayer for us is enough, and then there's a, yeah. there's a sense. So I hear I've heard that throughout your story too. This idea of just surrender, right? Okay, if that's what you. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. That's right. Then that's it. And that those moments, I've got stories like that too, where, oh yeah, when you give that, when you when you just let it go and you trust God, it's funny the the way things happen then, right? Like he and mm -hmm. it's not always what you want, right? But yeah. but you you develop more trust in him as you as you do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well that's that's great. Thank you for uh for just sharing some of your story. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm really excited to dive into this book. This is right uh, right up my alley. So I think, friends, if you uh, want to check it out as well, uh, again, the book is called Embracing Contemplation, uh, Reclaiming a Christian Spiritual Practice, edited by John Coe and Kyle Strobel. And uh, I've got links to it in the show notes at halfwaytherepodcast.com. Uh, as always, as well as all the books. So we mentioned a ton of them today. So there, I put a big list of uh, all the books there so you guys can check those out. Uh, Kyle, anything you want to leave us with? Yeah, let me let me just leave us with, let me kind of, just because I do think it's so easy to forget and, and yet it is so fundamental that going back to my comment about intercession, that, you know, prayer isn't something you generate. It's not something you start, it's something you enter. And that means you're called into something that God is already doing for you, through you, and from within you. And therefore, your very presence in prayer is grace. And I think if we can internalize that reality, prayer really will become a place to be both honest and free. Whereas for many of us, I worry it is it is a place where we're guilt ridden and we're trying to be good. And that is just where prayer goes to die. <laughs> so the call into the intercession of son and spirit is a call into freedom. Love it. Yeah, absolutely. If we just think of prayer as something we should be doing, not as a chance to commune with the creator, right, who made us, who loves us. Yeah. Uh, and to surrender to him, it's it is tremendously detrimental and so, friends, that's an invitation, I think. Go ahead and, uh, and pursue it, whether I hope that it's uh, you pick out this book and explore it, uh, or there's other great books that you can um, that will teach you how to do that, or hopefully you have a good mentor. So we try to, try to offer some of those as well. Kyle, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you hearing your story. Thanks, Eric. So good to be here, man.